Hello my friends, today we will finally take a look at Panasonic's first full-frame mirrorless camera intended for hybrid use, the Lumix S1. I have to admit that I was a little bit surprised when Panasonic announced the development of full-frame mirrorless camera. Their approach is a little bit different though. Unlike Sony, Nikon and Canon, Panasonic has decided to target the professionals right away. In this video we will take a look at how it performs and whether it really is full-frame without compromises. I guess that some of you might also be interested to see how does it compare to Sony A7 Mark III, which is currently the benchmark for hybrid full-frame cameras, so that comparison will be available soon as well. Lumix S-Line is designed as a replacement of traditional DSLR cameras. Panasonic has decided that instead of making the camera smaller, they will keep the size of full-frame DSLR camera and use the extra space to add more technology. The S1 is not a small camera. If you are looking for a small camera, this is not it. I can definitely say that it is built like a tank. All of the materials are premium, it feels super solid, all of the buttons and dials have great feel. It is very comprehensively weather sealed. Reliability and durability was one of the top priorities and I have no complaints about the build quality at all. Panasonic S1 uses 24 megapixel full frame sensor. Unlike the competition, Panasonic is probably not using backside illumination on this sensor. The dynamic range on S1 is excellent. You can recover a huge amount of information from both highlights and shadows to the point where you don't really have to worry much about the exposure. Particularly impressive is the highlight recovery, which is significantly better than on smaller or older sensors. Regarding the ISO performance, ISO 3200 is very clean. You can still use that even for printing. ISO 6400 is generally completely fine to use. You can still recover a lot of information in both highlights and shadows at ISO 6400. ISO 12800 is still okay, the noise is visible, but the noise pattern is not overly distracting, so I would consider 12800 to be still usable. ISO 25600 is more of an emergency option, but the colors are still accurate and it could be used for online publishing. Overall, the low light performance on the S1 is great, unlike the Z6, it has no issues with bending, so it is a great low light camera, and I haven't even talked about the in body image stabilization yet. 24 megapixels is still plenty enough for me personally and for most hybrid shooters. If you need more resolution, you can get the S1R with 47.3 megapixels. I have made a review of that one as well, it provides great image quality and extremely detailed stills, but for that one you also need to have a publishing platform that can take an advantage of that resolution. Most users will be fine with 24 megapixels. There is also an option to shoot 96 megapixel stills in high resolution mode. It works on a tripod, the camera will stitch 8 pictures together and create one picture with huge amount of detail and information. Just like Panasonic's Micro Four Thirds cameras, the S1 produces great out of camera colors. Unedited RAWs are maybe a bit more neutral and toned down, so those are a good starting point for developing and they work great with AI accent filter in Luminar. JPEGs in standard picture style are more punchy and saturated. If you prefer more natural look, you can go with natural picture style. Regarding the handling, as I have said, the S1 is a big camera, so there is space for very deep and well-shaped grip. Even with 70 to 200 mm f4, the balance is really good, and that is pretty heavy lens. Wide balance, ISO and exposure compensation buttons are positioned behind the shutter, I like that. Power switch is now also behind the shutter, here I would prefer a ring around the shutter like on the G9. There are three exposure dials of course. Video recording button is now on the back of the camera, mode dial combined with dry mode dial is similar to the one that we can find on the G9. New addition is lock switch that has been added and you can also set what do you want to lock once it is engaged. There are two more buttons on the front of the camera, these are pretty easy to reach, and two position switch that we already know from the G9 has also been carried over, and I use that one for silent mode. Status LCD is here as well, I never use it on any camera, but again, it is useful for former DSLR shooters. 
It shows you how much power and card space you have left even when the camera is turned off, which is very practical. Some of the buttons are also illuminated, which is very useful for shooting at night, although it would be nice to have more illuminated buttons. I also like the joystick on the S1. It moves in 8 directions and it is a bit more tactile on the G9, so it works great. Overall, I really like the handling on S1. It is the best handling full frame mirrorless camera in my opinion, I like the placement of buttons, the grip is good and it provides very good balance with heavier lenses. Of course, that was also achieved by making much larger camera than the competitors, so it is a different approach and it is great that those who prefer handling over the portability now have a mirrorless option as well. As you probably know, Panasonic has decided to stick to their contrast-based DFD autofocus system, so how does it work? In usual situations such as landscapes or focusing on non-moving subjects in good light, it works very well. Focus acquisition is basically instant, it is very accurate and there is no hunting. Tracking actually works pretty well in good light and I was able to get pretty solid hit rate as I was walking towards the camera. It probably won't be ideal for something like indoor sports, but for intended purposes I would say that it is sufficient. The best focusing Panasonic camera is still the G9, Panasonic is also saying that it is the one that you should get for sports and wildlife and it really focuses better than the S1. New feature on this autofocus is AI learning, which means that if you select the smart mode, it will be able to recognize objects in the frame and it will also adjust the focus settings for that object. It can also recognize multiple objects in the frame and you can use joystick to select what should be tracked. There is also new OnePlus area setting with auxiliary area which is used when the subject moves out of the main focus area, so now I mostly use that one. Manual focusing has also been improved by the addition of option to use linear focus ring control, so you can turn the speed sensitivity off if you don't like it. In video, the autofocus is similar to the GH5. It works pretty well. If you know how to use it, you can get really good results. The autofocus is accurate and relatively fast. It is not as responsive and not as reliable as the phase detection systems, but as long as it has some contrast to work with, it works. If you try to make it fail, it is possible, but I think that it is all around usable for situations where it is generally reasonable to use autofocus while shooting video. S1 is definitely intended for hybrid use, so it has some very impressive video specs as well. It shoots 4K up to 30 frames per second using the whole sensor and full pixel readout. The amount of detail in 4K video is excellent, it just looks great, there is not much more that I can say about that. For now it shoots 8-bit 420, but 10-bit 422 as well as the full VLOG will be available with software key. S1 can also shoot 4K in 60p, but only with 1.5 times crop in Super 35 or APS-C mode. That is still a very nice option and the image quality is pretty good in crop mode as well. Of course, full sensor 4K 60p would be better, but cropped 4K 60p is definitely better than nothing. What I also like is that unlike on the GH5 and GH5S, there is no NTSC slash PAL switching nonsense on the S1. 24, 25, 30, 50 and 60 frames per second recording is available in all resolutions up to 4K. The video looks great at ISO 1600, there is minimal amount of noise, so it is completely fine. 3200 is still very good and I would definitely consider that usable. Instead of showing the noise, the S1 applies a massive amount of noise reduction. You can see that from ISO 6400 when you can't see almost any noise because it will sacrifice the details instead and smooth out the noise. More detail disappears at ISO 12800, but there is very little noise. S1 also has new flat picture style which captures some extra dynamic range, but it is not as flat as the VLOG. In my opinion, it is very good compromise between the dynamic range and the ease of color grading, so I mainly use that one for the video. Some amount of rolling shutter is visible in 4K, but it is nowhere near as bad as Canon for example, and it definitely won't ruin your footage. Overall, the S1 is very good video camera. The ultimate option for video is probably still the GH5S. That one can shoot 4K 60p using the whole sensor, and it can also shoot real cinema 4K, which is one of the things that I missed on the S1. 
The S1 is better at high ISO though, and unlike the GH5S, it also has in-body image stabilization rated for 5.5 stops. If you use it together with stabilized lens in dual IS2 mode, it goes up to 6 stops. That is probably the main benefit of that large body, because there has to be more space to move the sensor. The efficiency of Dual IS2 with 24 to 105 kit lens is actually closer to the G9 rather than the GH5. It also makes the S1 and S1R the best cameras on the market for shooting non-moving subjects at night. You can go very low with shutter speed, something like one full second is not a problem, even three seconds are possible, so you can go very low with ISO. This is overall a huge strength of the S1 and one of top three features of this camera. That brings us to another big selling point of the S1, which is the electronic viewfinder. It uses 5.69 million dot panel, so it is extremely sharp and actually very close to optical viewfinder. That is very important for those who are switching from DSLRs. The magnification is 0.78 times, which is above average and definitely big enough. It is the best viewfinder that I have ever used. It can go up to 120Hz refresh rate, so big thumbs up for the viewfinder. Screen is also great, it uses 3.2 inch panel with 2.1 million dots, so it is super sharp, very bright and overall just joy to use. It uses tilting mechanism and it is tiltable in both landscape and portrait mode. That was probably the most controversial point of this camera, but it seems like people got over it. User interface is traditionally a strength of Panasonic. There are some changes in comparison with Lumix G-Line. The quick menu is new, everything that you might need to change on the go is still here, and you can choose from two templates and customize it. It is very good quick menu, although I probably prefer the full screen version on Lumix G cameras. Main menu is more structured, which is a good thing, since the S1 may be the most complex camera on the market. All of the main tabs, such as photo options and video options, are divided into subcategories, and I like that a lot, because it really makes the navigation much faster. Regarding the card options, there is one slot for XQD card and one slot for UHS-2 SD card. That is great for professional use, you can set it up for backup or divide RAWs and JPEGs or stills and video. Personally, I would prefer two UHS-2 SD card slots, I don't think that XQD is necessary, but looking at the competition with one card, I will gladly take XQD and SD option. S1 can shoot up to 9 frames per second with autofocus single or 6 frames per second with continuous autofocus. 9 and 6 frames per second is ok for the S1, 12 and 9 would be nice, but as I have said the G9 is still the high speed option, with up to 60 frames per second in RAW. S1 also uses very soft shutter, probably the softest of all full frame cameras, and it is rated for 400,000 cycles. S1 and S1R use new batteries with huge 3100 mAh capacity. That kind of capacity is really needed because of all of the features that drain the battery, such as the in-body image stabilization, high-resolution electronic viewfinder, display, and so on. The battery is rated for 380 shots according to the testing cycle. In reality, it can do much more than that, and if you use power saving option, it can shoot about 1150 shots on full charge. It can also be charged through USB-C and it comes with 3 amp charger, so the charging in camera is pretty fast and it is probably the best implementation of USB-C interface on any camera so far. S1 uses L-mount, but I still think that the lens selection is the biggest weakness of this system at the moment. Just like the S1, Panasonic L-mount lenses sacrifice the portability in order to provide superior optical qualities and I can say that both zooms are optically excellent, despite that those are only f4 lenses. I especially miss some small autofocus primes, I really like to use those on E-mount, but it doesn't seem like those will be available for L-mount anytime soon. Leica lenses are not relevant for most users because of the price, and I generally don't think that integrated adapters into Sigma's DSLR lenses is the right approach for mirrorless systems. I am very curious to see the new lenses that will be available for the L-mount in the future. To sum up, the S1 is hybrid camera that takes very different approach than the competitors. There is a lot of areas where it beats the competition, it has the best in-body image stabilization, viewfinder, monitor, 
controls and user interface in the class. To achieve that, Panasonic had to sacrifice the portability. This is a big camera and the lenses are big as well. I wouldn't say that it is a disadvantage, but it is definitely a compromise. Sensor performance is great, both dynamic range and ISO performance are great. The autofocus is good enough for everything except for fast moving subjects. Video features are great for a full frame camera, but some crop sensor cameras such as the GH5, GH5S and X-T3 offer more advanced options. The battery life is about average. I am generally very glad that this camera exists and that there is finally something new on the market. I hope that this system will continue to be developed and I am looking forward to seeing more L-mount cameras and especially the lenses. So that's it for this video, thank you for watching, I hope that you liked this video and that you found it to be useful. Stay tuned for more videos and maybe consider subscribing if you don't want to miss my future content. I appreciate your feedback in form of thumbs up or thumbs down. If you would like to ask anything or share your opinion, please do so in the comment section and see you next time.